On the panel, you got very, very emotional recalling what happened back in 2000. Yes, I did. Why was it such a moment for you? Because I had refused to reflect upon, um, to recall those painful and difficult um, personal kinds of investments that were required to participate in the rally, in the meetings and conversations and what have you. This was so different from just being a historian and coming to a conference and giving a paper and meeting with your friends and colleagues and uh, or going to the library and doing the research and writing the books. No, this was something I was not prepared for, this activist historian. Um, and it was not, um, it was not easy. And you mentioned that you had made a decision years earlier not to be active. What was that about? I had made decision not to be active in a public venue, that I would never uh, attend, much less address a rally protesting anything, that I would do my activist work either in the classroom or in the community, but it would always be um, small scale. Okay. And the reason why I was like that was because of what happened to me as a graduate student when I was uh, at Kent State University working with August Meyer. Uh, and on May 4th, 1970, I and a couple of other graduate students decided to go and stand on the, on the uh, grassy knoll, so to speak, and watch the protest uh, against the Vietnam War. And never in a million years could I have imagined that those guns were loaded and that four students would die. We were standing there talking about, sure, the guards have guns, but there are no bullets in those guns. Who comes to a college campus and kills students? It should be a safe place, a sacred place. We're just there to learn and to try and get at some kind of truth and understanding. And after that happened, I didn't want to talk in any public venue. And I didn't want to go to any rally. You joked uh, when you were on the podium and said that uh, uh, ever since then you haven't stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still don't go to rallies though. <laughs> But ever since then, I haven't stopped talking, and and I'm very passionate about talking history. And so that's been what I talk. The point that I made at that rally is the point that resonates in everything I say today about history. African American history is American history. What we call black history, that's American history. Women's history, it's American history. You know, all of these people who have contributed so much to making this country what it is today, and sure there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but every group needs to be recognized for their contributions and their humanity. One of the other uh, points you made while you were up on the panel was that uh, this was a uh, turning point in the history of this organization. Yeah. In what way? Well, for the first time, the organization took a very public and principled stance against racism. And there's a lot of internal uh, division and, and criticism. People didn't think that we should be public, that we should insert ourselves into controversies. Uh, that have nothing to do, so to speak, with history. 
How can we maintain our objectivity about anything if we're out in the streets marching and protesting and speaking out loud? You were the incoming president of this organization. Yes. Did you feel a particular burden? I felt as if I had to juggle a number of sometimes competing interests and that I had to put the interests of the organization above all personal and professional interests. Because once you become the president of the Organization of, Amer of American Historians, then it's all about our organization and about our profession. And um, you have to be very careful about how you handle uh, your various constituencies within a very complicated uh, professional organization. You made a reference up there to uh, Frederick Douglass. Yes. Frederick, oh, that had, I made the reference to Frederick Douglass because I was asked to uh, raise some money uh, to, on the night of the presidential uh, address by David Montgomery, I was asked if I would help the OAH out by going up into the podium and doing something that no one else had ever done before at an OAH uh, address. But, you know, David Montgomery was probably the first president of the OAH uh, to ever give a, an address at a church. So we're at a church. We need money. Well, somebody has to go up and raise money. That's what churches do. And so, as president-elect, I was asked to go up to the to the uh, uh, the pulpit and raise this money. And all I could think about, having never done this before, was Frederick Douglass and how Frederick Douglass was made the president of the Freedmen's Bureau Bank, and within six months. It had failed, closed the doors, you know, and people were saying, as I thought they would, when I became president and the OEH collapses because it doesn't have any money, that that's proof. Black people should not be presidents of banks, should not be presidents of any organization that requires them to raise money. And so with that sort of scenario in my mind, I decided to fail big. So I said to everybody, uh, I'm here to raise money for the OEH, pay some of our legal fees. So if there's anybody with $500 who'd like to donate it to the OEH, would you please come up now? And I stood there and people started laughing because historians are notoriously uh, short change when it comes to big salaries. But Timothy Tyson from the University of Wisconsin got up from the back of the church and walked all the way up and he says, here's my $500. And it was like an amazing moment because then everybody started putting uh, as much as they could afford into uh, the donation uh, basket, and I understand we raised eight thousand dollars in that night. And eventually, uh, Lee Formwalt said that uh, uh, the organization uh, raised what was it, ninety thousand dollars. It continued to raise money because a lot of new people joined the organization once they saw how principled we were and that as an organization, we were willing to go to the mat uh, on, on the side of righteousness and inclusivity and respect for all of our humanity. And, uh, and that, was a, that was a powerful drawing card for an organization of um, what the local press had called some sleepy historians. We woke up that night. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you.